Play ball. Hey, Dune Baseball fans. Welcome to another edition of The Brushback with J.P. Ricciardi. I'm John Arezzi. Joining me as always, he is the star of the show. He's the former GM, the former front office executive, the announcer, and baseball lifer, Mr. J.P. Ricciardi. J.P., how you doing? Hey, John. How you doing, buddy? Doing very good. Uh, we got less than two weeks now, uh, and these games, each one of the major leagues, each one takes on a playoff atmosphere, especially if you're in contention. Uh, we got your hot takes on the race. We got the big stories of the week, and we have another great special guest on Batter Up with a JP. Tell us who your special guest is today. Yeah, we got an interesting cat, FP Santangelo, a uh, longtime major league player, served in different roles as a utility guy, played in different places, uh, gets to share his story, gets to tell the kids out there about how the grind it is to get to the big leagues, the confidence in yourself. Uh, it's gone on to be a uh, an announcer uh, with the Nationals and now is doing stuff with the Giants. So entertaining guy and one of the characters in baseball. Well, we uh, look forward to that for sure, but let's get right to the hot takes. Uh, the hot takes are brought to you by Percy's Appliance Outlet featuring brand name appliances at up to 80% off regular retail prices. They are Worcester's largest dealer of home appliances and electronics serving the Worcester area for over 80 years, and they are your 80% off uh, place to go for electronics, for all the deals, the sales on refrigerators, washers, dryers, bedding, so much more. Call 508-438-6800. Same day or next day delivery options are available. Percy's, they are that 80% off appliance outlet. All right, JP, uh, down to the final days of the regular season. Each game pressure-filled. Every inning takes on additional meaning. And I want to uh, touch upon a game and a series between the San Diego Padres and the Houston Astros, both teams in the hunt. Uh, every inning is taking on additional meaning. And every close call, every umpire missed call or wrong call from review can have a huge impact to a team. Watching the uh, – Astros and Padre series this week. Home plate umpire Brennan Miller botched not one but two critical plays, and the MLB reviewers also refused to overturn a call, which both teams wanted overturned. The first was Jose Altuve uh, fouling a pitch off his foot in the ninth inning. Umpire Miller said it was not a foul. Altuve was thrown out on what was uh, ruled a ground out in a critical spot, and he never even ran the first. He was ejected when he turned into shoeless. Jose, let's get to that clip right now and take a look at it. And hits out Tuve's foot. They're going to say fair ball. ball. Brennan Miller's going to say that ball didn't hit out Tuve, and that's going to be the final out of the inning. Brennan Miller is not ingratiating himself to Astros players, coaches, or manager. You got to ask for help. You got to check with other umpires to see if it did hit out Tuve. Um, Altuve needs to be pulled out of the situation. They need to keep him in this game. They're going to say that's a fair ball, and it did not hit Altuve in the end of the inning. Josh Hader taking the mound here for the bottom half of the ninth inning. <laughs> Altuve showing he where it hit his foot, sock. and now he's ejected. Oh man, that's amazing. You're right, though. They should have got Altuve out of there. He's yes. been ejected. We're going to have a tie game heading to the bottom of the ninth. Altuve will limp off the field. This game is crazy. Jose Altuve ejected. Here's a replay, Blummer. Yeah, you can see the top of the shit. Watch the baseball changing a little bit of direction, hitting off that big toe of Jose Altuve before it goes to third base. But none of the, none of the umpires brought in. Brennan Miller making that call on his own. But it looked like a change of direction to the point that Jose Altuve took off his shoe and sock to show where that ball hit. I've never seen that before. There's Altuve trying to show the evidence. Hit him right there. Hulk is exposed. Well, there's a couple of things here, John. First of all, I didn't think it was as clear cut as the announcers thought it was clear cut when you watch the video of it. But the re you got to have a little bit of a feel. If the player doesn't run, that's a pretty good indication that he thinks something happened to him. That's number one. Number two, how do you not ask for help? He just stood there and talked to the manager and was trying to put his point of view and what he saw to the manager, all he had to do was tell the spotter, listen, let me check. Let me get some other help here. He turns around and gets some help. Um, 
someone in the field might have saw something different. But not to ask for help, I think, is a major mistake. And then, the you know, obviously you go to the replay. But I, I don't know how you felt, but I'm watching the replay. I, I didn't think it was as clear cut as maybe they made it out to, to look. So that one, I'm going to say I – put a little bit of blame on the umpire for not asking for help on the field. If at that point you determine that it's not a foul ball, then okay, at least you ask for help. But the second one we're going to get into, this one totally blows my mind. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into it in a second. But uh, the last question I have to you on Altuve, uh, with him removing his, uh, you know, his shoe, his sock, is that justification for automatic ejection? <laughs> If you well, were not there, I, I think at that point you're forcing the umpire's hand. But I go back to the '69 World Series when yeah. uh, someone got hit on the foot. Cleon Jones. Yeah. It was Cleon Jones and uh, oh, uh, Gil Hodges, the manager, went out, showed the umpire the scuff, the polish on the on the ball, and the umpire awarded him first base. Now, in this case, unless his uh, toe is throbbing and there's stitches on his toe. I'm sure the umpire is going to say, hey, you're trying to show me up here. Right, and you're out, yeah. and you're yeah. out of here. Yeah, He exactly had to throw right. him out at that point. I thought it was pretty creative by Altuve, though. Yeah, it, was, it was creative. It was very entertaining, but it's such a critical game as well for both teams, actually. Uh, the next uh, clip that we're going to show, and you brought it up, JP, it is. Uh, uh, it was crazy. Same game, 10th inning this time. Uh, Jaraxon Profar was awarded uh, first on a pitch in the bottom of the 10th inning. Uh, that the same umpire, Miller, said hit him, which clearly it did not. Both teams protested, especially Profar, who wanted to complete the at-bat. The play was challenged, and shockingly, the MLB reviewers kept the call. Craziest thing I've ever seen in a long time. So let's watch that clip right now and get J.P.'s hot take on the other side. Last of the 10th. Up and in, and... But he's not taking his pace for some reason. I don't think. Why was he pointing to first base? They're gonna. They're gonna. Have now coming a, down is Conroy. And I review this. So they are challenging the hit batsman. Ruling on the field is hit by pitch. Pitch is challenging. Hit by pitch by the home plate umpire Brennan Miller. He was telling him to take his base. Yeah, that didn't look like it hit him. Remember, the call on the field is hit by pitch, so right. they'll have to have the evidence to overturn it. What I found odd was that Profar was not running down to first base like he had been hit. You always watch the That's, player's initial yeah. reaction. It tells you a lot. Now take into consideration too that he did have the elbow guard on and may, may not, not have felt, felt it. it. Yeah. Call here we go. After review of the call, the field stands. Hit by pitch. Batter's order. First base. Houston retains the challenge. Wow! What a what a night by that ump. Yeah, not good. Uh, and uh, Profar had a much more animated uh, reaction uh, after uh, that clip ended. Uh, he just couldn't believe it because he wanted that at bat. And then Machado gets up next, grounds into a uh, game ending uh, ground out, and uh, Houston wins the game four to three. Well, it goes back to we put these rules in place to get it right. So the umpire obviously. And you watch the replay. The umpire looks right at the player right away. He's almost reacting to the player's reaction. And I think he just assumed that he got hit. You clearly could see on the replay he did not get hit. And even if you get hit on the elbow guard, you still feel that. So there's a reaction like, oh, I got hit. But the ball didn't get misdirected or changed direction in any way. So that led me to believe that it didn't hit him. I I don't even believe it grazed him. No. Once again, you go ask for help. If the help can't confirm it or deny it, you go to a replay. How they didn't see that, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe the game was too late for the guys in New York. I I, I don't know. Maybe. But, 
But <laughs> that one's more egregious than the other one because I think that one was pretty clear cut that the, the ball did not touch the player. And like you said, you're in the middle of these pennant races and all these games mean something. And these calls come down to, you know, an umpire's discretion. Without asking for help, it's hard to feel sorry for the umpire. Yeah, uh, and San Diego uh, uh, did lose a game uh, in that wild card race, which is uh, tremendously close. And we're going to talk about that because the New York Mets are right in the middle of it, obviously. And they had a, uh, which was potentially disastrous situation when Francisco Lindor uh, hurt his back overrunning the base uh, on Friday night's game. Right after the game, David Stearns called up uh, Luis Angel Acuna, who uh, the Mets got in that trade last year when they got rid of Scherzer and he got Acuna back as part of that package. Uh, and this kid was brought up, and he's the first rookie uh, that the Mets brought up this entire season, the, uh, the last major league team to use a rookie this season. And this guy has performed. He has, uh, with Lindor out, we don't know how long Lindor is going to be out for it, uh, from the Mets, uh, his MRI came back clean, but he's not playing right now. So Cunha comes up in a in a very uh, high pressure situation. Uh, I want to show you a clip of what this young man did last night for the New York Mets. That's laced to left center field. That's going to go up the gap and all the way to the wall. Bader to third. He'll get a wave home and he'll score easily. It's an RBI double for Luis Sunhel Acuna. His first major league extra base hit. His first major league run batted in. And it ties the game at one. One, two. Curve ball hit toward the middle of the diamond. That'll go through for a base hit. So Acuna's got his second hit of the night. He's now got four hits in his first ten big league at bats. He drives this one deep left field toward the wall. It's out of here. Luis Acuna with his first major league home run. His third hit of the game. It increases the Mets lead to 10 to 1. But this has been one memorable night for young Luis Angel Acuna, who circles the bases, hopeful of getting the souvenir ball eventually for his first big league home run. Congratulations, kid. Hey, you know that's the way you, it, oh, yeah, I've seen this kid play a lot this year in AAA. He's got a lot of energy. He's got a lot of athleticism. He really got a lot of bounce to his step. He's got a similar swing to his brother. He's got a, little, a lot of pop in the bat. I think there's going to be some swing and miss, but he hasn't been exposed yet. Uh, and I think sometimes when a young kid comes to the big leagues and he just can let it fly and they haven't seen any of his deficiencies yet, he can hit the ground running, and this kid's done a good job. He's very good defensively. Uh, like I said, he – He's going to be able to give them some energy. He can run, and he's got power. And if he keeps playing like this, you know, they're going to have to find a way to keep him in the lineup once uh, Lindor comes back too. So, you know, the old saying, you ride him when they're hot, ride this kid when he's hot, he's got off to a great start. So that you really didn't miss much with uh, Lindor being out. And this is, a, this is a great way to step, have a guy step in and kind of stem the tide. So good for the Mets. Yeah, that was a big worry for Mets fans. And uh, one thing about Acuna as well, uh, the Mets have been having him play second base center field uh, just to give him that uh, versatility because Lindor is not going anywhere at shortstop. So you're going to have to find another place for this kid to play. Uh, and he could back up uh, Lindor, back up Iglesias, uh, go to uh, center field as well. And uh, the cool thing about it is next week, the Mets play the Braves and he may have a part in uh, uh, that big series, uh, especially with his, with his brother uh, who's injured right now, but uh, that's going to be pretty cool to see uh, when the Mets go to Atlanta next week. Uh, we have one more hot take for you. And we're going to get to that right after this word from Percy's home appliance outlet. Percy's Appliance Showroom, featuring a huge selection of the finest brand names from value to luxury at the guaranteed lowest prices. Whether it's an individual appliance or package, buy with confidence with Percy's Price Match Guarantee. Percy's offers exceptional customer service, fast expert installation, delivery, and removal. For same-day shopping, look for the green in-stock buttons on percys.com and available long-term interest-free financing. Percy's, first on Gold Star Boulevard, Worcester. 
All right, JP, uh, we're going to take a look at the brackets right now and where everyone stands at this point uh, in the playoff picture. Uh, these brackets are, you know, can change somewhat with these wild card races. Uh, but if we could take a look at those brackets right now, uh, we will be able to kind of uh, take a look at where these teams stand. And uh, JP, want to get your hot take on where we are right now in the playoff picture. So here we go. As of today, this would be uh, the brackets if the season ended today. Well, I mean, it is what it is, so to speak. Uh, I think there's a couple of changes that could happen, give or take a Seattle playing well, a Detroit playing well. But just on a first look, the Twins are not playing really well right now. And if they limp into the playoffs, <clears throat> I don't see how they beat Houston, especially if Houston gets their pitching right. Uh, I'll tell you, an interesting one for me is going to be Kansas City and Baltimore because the Orioles have not played well in the second half. Mm -mm. And I don't think their pitching, their starting pitching has been great. And Kansas City's kind of found a way to hang in there. Um, I'm not so sure that that's a slam dunk for the Orioles. I wouldn't be surprised if if Kansas City upset them. You go over to the West, I think the Padre Mets would be a very good matchup. Uh, Obviously, that's determined if Atlanta doesn't knock out the Mets. Right. <clears throat> but San Diego's played really, really well in the second half. I think they've got the best record in the second half in all of baseball. The Mets, I think, have the second or third. So that'll be a very interesting uh, matchup because it's two teams playing their best baseball. I think I would lean towards San Diego in that one. <clears throat> and Milwaukee and Arizona. Arizona's had a better second half, but Milwaukee's been a really good team from start to finish. I think their athleticism, I think they've got a lot of ways to beat you. They play very good defense. Uh, I could see Milwaukee uh, getting by Arizona there. And then as you move over, uh, Houston and Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland's had a very consistent year, a good club, great closer. Uh, but I still, ha- I believe you got to knock Houston off. You're going to have to to cut that snake's head off. And I don't know if Cleveland is, is good enough to beat the Astros. I'm going to go with Houston in that series. Uh, I don't think anybody beats the Yankees in that Kansas City Baltimore series. And if you switch over, Brewers Dodgers is going to be an outstanding series. And as much as you think on paper you'd want to go with the Dodgers, for me, I, I think the Brewers are going to come out of that because I think they're they're more a complete club. I think they defend better, and I think their starting pitching is a little better overall. Uh, if I went with San Diego and the Phillies, I I like the Phillies all year. I think they're a good club. I think the National League, for me, comes down to Philadelphia and Milwaukee. The American League, for me, comes down to Houston and the Yankees. And if I had to make a prediction, I'm going to say it's a Yankee-Philly World Series. Which would be an amazing World Series. As much as I love the Mets, as you know, but the Yankees against the Phillies, uh, that would be dynamic. So, uh, yeah, and And I think, you know, as much as we like to see some of the other teams, the bottom line is you got two traditional teams i think the country it's a it's a very heavy east coast bias but uh i think the networks and everybody else would be happy with that yeah when you got soto you got judge you know you have uh, garrett cole and then you have harper and castellanos and schwerber and and And, and that that, that environment in Uh, philadelphia that that environment's crazy to play in so i think it would be an absolutely amazing world series i wouldn't be surprised if the brewers got to the world series though yeah, they are uh, they are a great team, and just watching them throughout the season, uh, anything can happen in the next few weeks, and we'll be covering it here, uh, JP. So uh, it's going to be an exciting finish for sure, a uh, very exciting finish to this baseball season. And uh, we will now have uh, Batter Up with JP right after this. Now it's time for Batter Up with JP, brought to you by the Worcester Bravehearts. The Bravehearts are already planning for 2025 to make an an even better family entertainment experience than ever before. All season long, the Bravehearts offered great baseball combined with an overall great value for you and your family. And in 2025, they'll be doing it again. Follow the Bravehearts on Instagram at Woo Baseball for all the updates on the planning for 2025. Or listen for those updates right here on this show. Go to WorcesterBravehearts.store.com to get some Bravehearts merch, including caps, T-shirts, jerseys, and sweatshirts today. Hey, 
everybody. Welcome to the show. We got a great guest today, longtime friend, guy I scouted for a ton of years. Probably saw him play more than his parents played, saw him play. Um, <laughs> former major league player, major league announcer, currently working with the Giants, FP Santangelo. FP, thanks for coming on the show, buddy. JP, it's always nice to see you. Uh, it's always nice to do anything with my twin brother. <laughs> So we're, we're going to jump right into this because uh, I know you got a, a lot of energy and a lot of things you'd like to share about the game. You say you're staying constant with it. Um, one of the great things I like about you is you always have a lot of energy for the game. You remind me of, I always think of Rex Hudler. I think of FP Santangelo. <laughs> you guys are just bubbling with enthusiasm. So the first question I have for you, when did you fall in love with baseball? I was at early age. Uh, my father loved baseball. My grandfather played in the Bronx uh, in, in like vacant lots and empty lots. He used to sneak away from when he was a teenager from his job and he couldn't tell his parents because, you know, that was frowned upon. He had to be at work. So he was a catcher in Sandlot baseball uh, and he had a passion for the game. And he passed it on to my dad who played in high school and college. And then when I was six years old, JP, I went to a Detroit Tigers game. My first game ever. I grew up in, in Detroit before I moved to California and I was in left field, and you remember old Tiger Stadium where the upper deck hung over yep, the outfield. Well. Yep. And I was watching two guys play catch from the foul line in left field to like, I don't know, left center field. And I didn't say a word with my dad, and I was just watching back and forth. And they kept looking up at us, and they played catch. And at the end, one of the guys threw a baseball to my dad, and he reached out over the thing and caught it. And that was the day I knew I wanted to be a major league baseball player. And, and, and it just was the coolest thing ever that there was grass in the middle of the city, that the guys got to play this game that I loved already at six years old. And then they got paid for it on top of it. I thought <laughs> it was the greatest thing ever. Um, and, and just to fast forward a little bit, how that influenced my life that day in batting practice in the big leagues every day, when we were running off the field, I would have a ball in my hand and I would look for a kid that wasn't saying anything. It wasn't like, give me a ball, give me a bat, can you sign this? I would just find the quiet kid sitting there, and I'd run over and I'd put a ball in his lap every day, hoping that maybe someday I could influence a kid the way I was influenced that day at Tiger Stadium. Uh, that's a great story. It's, uh, Isn't it funny how everybody we have on the show, we've had several guests, they all revert back to uh, having something to do with a connection with their dad. And I think that's the greatest thing about baseball. It is just having a catch with your dad. And, and I, I, you know, nowadays you got travel ball and kids are playing year round. And, you know, I played basketball, football, baseball, ran track. And, and there was nothing cooler than like grabbing your dusty glove out of the closet during baseball season. And my dad, who played baseball, never forced it on me. It was just like, hey, you want to go play catch? You want to go hit today? And he would, we have a bucket of balls. We'd go hit. We played catch. We played wiffle ball all the time. And it was always fun. He never really forced anything on me. And I never got sick of baseball. I, 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 and to this day, I'm, I'm 57 years old. I still have to be at the ballpark every day. I have to be around it. It's my happy place, as I'm yeah. sure you can relate. Nobody knows better than you. Like, no matter what's going on in my personal life, when I walk through the gates at Oracle Park or Wrigley Field or wherever, Yankee Stadium, it's just like everything goes away. And I'm a little kid again, six years old in Tiger Stadium. Nice to be able to keep that at our age, too. It is. It is. I mean, I'm blessed. I'm fortunate. I wouldn't know what to do, JP, without baseball. Yeah, I feel the same way. You know, I just I just retired. It was 43 years in the game as a, a player. So many different uh, backgrounds. But, you know, you just keep coming back to that little kid. It brings out the little kid in you. And uh, so I wanted I wanted to touch base with you because to me, um, everybody knows about the star players in baseball. But what they don't realize is out of the 700 something major league players, about 500 of them are guys who have to grind to get to the big leagues, to stay in the big leagues, to find their niche. And, and you were one of those guys. So to the young kids who are listening to the show, to the guys in the minor leagues that are grinding, like I said, I scouted you a lot of years in Ottawa. Talk to the people about your progression, how you started, where you went, what your mindset was, because you weren't the biggest guy, you weren't the fastest guy, but you found a way to survive. Just, just speak to speak to that because I think it's it's a great reflection on what you've become as a as a baseball person. Well, I mean, nobody's had a better year, a better career, I should say, in baseball with having a mediocre career like I had. So, um, 
But I was a 20th round draft pick. I signed for $1,000 as a favor to Jerry Weinstein, who was my junior college coach at Sacramento City College. He called the Expos and said, hey, this kid plays hard. And I was at University of Miami, and I had a great season there with the Hurricanes and got drafted in the 20th round, like I said, and signed for $1,000. And I knew in my heart that if I just got my foot in the door in the minor leagues, that I would make it to the big leagues. Like, just give me a chance and I got this because I had supreme confidence in my ability, supreme confidence in myself. JP, for a kid that was too small, too slow, too this, too that, in, in, in high school and in college and the pros, when people told me I couldn't do something, that was fuel in my tank. I wanted to show people wrong. I wanted to prove people wrong. And it's almost like at this point in my career, I wish I could go back and thank all those people that said, uh, we can't draft this guy. He's, he's, not, he's not professional big league material or – even my coach at Cal, I got a scholarship to Cal out of high school, and, and I went to Cal Berkeley, and I wasn't playing my sophomore year. A guy named Jeff Kent came in and took my job at shortstop, and I wasn't playing. And I went into Bob Milano's office, who was the coach, the head yep. coach at Cal, and I said, hey, do you see me playing here? And he said, no, use your scholarship for a great education. I don't see you playing here much, and I don't see you playing past here. And I said, thanks for your honesty. And I transferred back to Sac City College, played for Jerry Weinstein. They went to University of Miami. But like it, it, it's people like that, that that was fuel in my tank. So, you know, fast forward to I go to A ball. I play really well. Felipe Lou comes up and says, you're going to play in the big league someday. I'm 22, 23 years old at that point. I'm pretty old for A ball, maybe 24. Um, and then I go to double A and I have another good year. It, but, but, but still there was this underlying theme of he's not good enough. And I got to AAA um, and I had some good years in Ottawa and I was just stuck in AAA for four years. And it, it, so it, it added up to seven years in the minor leagues before I got my chance. And I'm, I'm making $10,000 a year before taxes my last year in AAA with a wife and with a kid. So I finally got to a point where I was always put my head down, work hard, stay in my lane. It's going to take care of itself. Bill Guy Vett was our minor league director. And one day I just said, you know what? I got to talk to this guy. And I said, look, Bill, my manager, Pete McCannon here in AAA, thinks I'm a, a, a major league player. Everybody gets sent down, tells me that I should be in the big leagues. Like, I'm a big league baseball player. I've done everything you've asked for this organization. You guys need to give me a chance. I deserve that. Like, and if I suck, you can all go have a beer and laugh and say, we were right, he's not a big leaguer. But I've hit 260, 270, 280 every year in AAA. I'm playing six positions. I'm not making errors. I'm a switch hitter. The National League, I could be the best double switch guy in the National League, I told him. Like the best sixth man. And he, he kind of laughed. And he wrote a chapter in his book about this. And he said, you know, this guy just believed in himself. And he's hitting 250 in AAA. And I told him he's got to work on this. He's got to work on that. I got called up three days later for standing up for myself, for believing right. in myself. Um, and he told me to get there early. They, they screwed with me in the clubhouse, but that's too long of a story. But they told me to get there early. So for a 7.30 game in Montreal, I was there at noon. And the locker room was locked. It was closed. <laughs> and I remember hitting hitting the, the, the button and the speaker, and some guy with a thick French accent said, uh, I'll send somebody down. Barely could understand him. And it was Bill Stoneman. And he came down, who was the president and I think GM maybe of the Expos yeah, at that yeah. time. And he said, uh, congratulations, FP. We're all excited for you. Don't you think you're a little early? And I said, Bill, I've been waiting my whole life for this. There's no such thing as early. So he let me in the clubhouse. I walk in. I'm the only guy. My jersey's hanging up in my locker, number seven. I sign a contract with Bill, like, in the back room. And he says, this is what you're going to make in AAA if you go back. This is what you're going to make right now. I said, Bill, I ain't going back. And he goes, FP, for some reason, I believe you. Bill has told that story like as a keynote <laughs> speaker a lot of times. So Felipe Alou, my manager, comes in. He's, he's there probably like a half hour later. And he comes over. He's my manager in A-ball. He congratulates me. And he goes into his office, and he puts me in the lineup the first day, hitting eighth. And then Bill Guyvette gets there because he's nervous. He's taking a chance on this guy, this career minor leaguer. And he says, Felipe, what are you doing? Are you crazy? You're playing him tonight? And I got two hits the first night. I got one hit left-handed, one hit right-handed, and I never went back. So uh, it was just one of those things where I think for young players and young people, no matter what you're doing in life, there's two kinds of people to me. There's people that they tell you you can't do something and like, ah, oh, you're right, I'm going to try something different. Or they tell you you can't do something and you're like, screw you. I'm going to show you 
that you're wrong. And I've always been the the, the, the latter. Like, hey, the same thing in broadcasting, JP. Like, people were like, oh, this guy sucks when I went to D.C. my first year. And I could have shut it down because you read the comments. Yeah. And, people, and then I said, you know what? I'm just going to keep working hard at it. And then they fell in love with me in D.C. after 10 years. And now I'm back here in San Francisco and I'm doing games on the radio for the Giants. And the fans seem to have taken to me here, too. So it's just one of those things where... I don't know. I guess I have a strong belief in myself uh, and I have a confidence in myself that's not cocky or arrogant. I feel like I'm a humble person, but like if somebody tells me I can't do something, that's like, thanks. I yeah. appreciate that. So people, I, a couple of things. One, in regards to your career, someone had to keep writing your name in the lineup. So you have to at least be given the opportunity to be able to play, to show these guys what you're capable of doing. And you've got the opportunity to play in the minor leagues, which formed your career and, and built respect with some of the managers you've played for. And you mentioned some really good baseball guys there that, you know, had a, a history of having you play for them that they could say, Hey, everything this guy's saying about this guy is right. He's going to get up here. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. But I don't think people realize how much talent was in the Expos organization at that time. Oh yeah. They, I mean, we had, I mean, I'd go on forever. Like a young Moises Alou, a young Marquise Grissom, a young Larry Walker. Um, and you just keep going around. I'm going to leave out a million guys, but there was so much talent that even if you're hitting 280 in AAA, there was nowhere to go. And, and, and back in the day, and this is where I'm going to sound a little bit old, JP, and I'm preaching the choir. You know this better than anybody. You had to be a complete baseball player to get called up yeah. to the big leagues. You had to play good defense. You had to be able to run the bases. You had to be a winning baseball player. Now we're just rushing kids because they, they have great spin right and great launch angle and great exit velocity and, and, and they're, they're showcase kind of players. But I see every day at the big leagues, guys that don't know where to be in a cutoff and relay, guys that don't know how to run the base. But their exit velocity was averaging 98 miles an hour in AAA. So that now they're a big league ball player. Um, and the one thing I always take pride in, JP, is I'd find a way to beat your ass. Like I was addicted to winning. I was going to do one little thing, and that was my goal, to help my team win a game every day. Whether it was a sacrifice bunt, whether it was reading a ball in the dirt and getting to the scoring position – whether it was running over a catcher on a play at the plate, like just do one thing to help your team win every day. I just don't think kids nowadays that get called up know how to win baseball games. They don't know what it like, like score of game, time of game, when to take a chance on the bases, when not to take a chance on the bases. I see guys bunting with the runner on second and two outs all the time. Like, what are you doing? Drive the run in. So I just don't think these, we rush them so fast now because there's so much pressure on managers and front offices to win baseball games now that we rush them to the big league so quick and they're learning how to play at the highest level, which is the hardest place right. how to right. learn uh, how to play baseball against the best players in the world. So I think in, in that regard, um, the game has changed a lot. Well, obviously you played a long time in the minor leagues and playing that much in the minor leagues, you learn the little things about the game and you learn what's important and you learn what the manager is looking for. And I think that helped you when you got to the big leagues, especially when you're playing for a guy like Philippe Ballou. I mean, the little things are so important. Speak to uh, speak to being in the big leagues and playing for someone like Philippe Ballou. JP, you also learn how to be a good teammate to right. the minor leagues. And I think that's super critical to success with an organization. But Felipe Alou, Felipe Alou is one of the biggest influences in my life, period. He's a guy that believed in me from day one in A-ball. He taught me how to be a, 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 a good baseball player, and he taught me how to be a grown man, uh, how to be accountable, how to be honest um, at a very early age in A-ball. And he loved guys that played hard because that's the way he played the game. And he loved guys that played fearless. That was his big word. He would, he would look at the bench and go, he's scared uh, about a guy that came in and threw ball one. Uh, but he liked guys that played fearless baseball, and that's the way I approach it every day. So we clicked at a, you know, at a low level in the minor leagues, um, and he admired the way I played baseball. And, and he told me that I was—he's the first guy to tell me I was going to be, be a big leaguer. And when he got the job in Montreal, that's when I kind of knew that I might have an outside chance of becoming a big leaguer for sure. I knew I could do it, um, but just I think I think good coaches make you better players, and great coaches make you a better person. And he was he was the best. I had ever been around in baseball to this day. I mean, he's, he's literally besides my parents and Jerry Weinstein, probably the biggest influence on my life, not just baseball. That, that's, that's a, uh, that's a pretty bold statement. Um, there's, 
there's becoming less and less of Expo players who played in Montreal. And I used to like going up to scout in Montreal because they weren't drawing that well. They, you could almost have your whole row to scout the game. But talk to the people who don't even know who the Montreal Expo, Expos were. Talk about playing in Montreal. What a great city. Talk about your experience there. And outside of Toronto and Montreal, those are the only two cities outside of the United States, and they're, and they're vastly different cities. So talk about playing in Montreal. Talk about your experiences there. Well, I mean, if you're going to be honest with people listening to your podcast, there's other reasons why you went to Montreal. Not just because, <laughs> not just because of the seats behind home plate. Uh, it's, a, it's a great city. It still is a great city. I've been up there in a long time. Um, but it, it was uh, the people of Montreal uh, know baseball. You walk down the street, they knew your batting average. You knew how many, you've won eight out of your last ten. They knew what place you're in, how many games out. The, the fans got – you know, first of all, you have two months of summer. They didn't want to go inside to the Olympic Stadium, which was an indoor dome stadium. And they were losing their favorite players every year, whether it was Larry Walker to the Rockies or Marquise Grissom to the Braves or Moises Lou to I think he went to the Marlins first. Uh, um, you know, I could keep going on and on with all the players, the Expos players, Pedro Martinez, the Red Sox. So they lost their favorite players every year and they became disgruntled with that fact. But they, you know, they were good fans. They were in, and I think, I think baseball would thrive in Montreal if it ever goes back there. If they had a nice little 32,000 seat downtown stadium, um, I think it'd be a great place for baseball to expand to. There's no doubt that, that they're great fans in Montreal, but the city itself was just vibrant, man. I mean, I would tell rookies, you got to be careful like cause the city doesn't close, man. You could stay out till four or five in the morning I saw rookies coming in the locker room just looking like hell. And I'd have to pull them aside and say, man, this town will eat you up. Be careful because there's a lot of fun to be had there. And it's just playing in Ottawa for three years and Montreal for four years. The Canadian, the Canadians are just wonderful people that live life to the fullest every single day. Um, They don't get caught up in materialistic things like we do in the United States. They're just about, are you a good person? Are you not a good person? Uh, and they love to have fun and they're just wonderful, wonderful people. So I spent seven seasons in Canada. Um, I can sing the whole the Canadian <laughs> national anthem in French from start to finish. And I don't even know French. Um, it just soaked in my brain for all those the double national anthems that we heard. So, yeah, it was a great place for a young player, JP, to break in. Because when you got to the big leagues in Montreal, you knew everybody in the clubhouse. It wasn't like you looked around and you're like, oh, there's Roger Clemens or, or there's Derek Jeter. You went, I came up with these guys. We right. played in eight ball in double A AA and triple A. So you felt comfortable in a big league clubhouse because you knew all of them. You won together in the minor leagues and you knew what kind of people they were and they accepted you immediately. And the media wasn't crazy there. You had like one beat writer in your locker after a game. It wasn't like there's 15, 20 people, a camera in your face. So it was a great place in, in a low pressure environment in a very uh, comfortable environment to break into the big leagues. So you had the distinct uh, pleasure of playing for both the Giants and the A's. So talk, talk about that difference in the sense of two totally different organizations. So I was with you when we were in Oakland and we were, you know, we were shoestring operation. And then you go, you know, across the Bay, one of the most iconic organizations in all the sport and, you know, first class in every way, share your experiences in both those towns. Well, I mean, a kid growing up in Northern California and going to A's games as a kid and then going to Giants games at Candlestick as a kid, if you'd have told 12-year-old me I was going to play for both teams, I would just, no way. So that, JP, I, I, I don't like to brag about a lot of things I've accomplished, but that's the thing I'm probably the most proud of. I only, I think only like 140 players have ever played for both teams, something like that. And I don't know how many of those 140 grew up going to both ballparks in our Northern California kids. So that's really something that now looking back at in my mid fifties that I'm super proud of. Um, I grew up more of a Giants fan and going to Giants games and the families I hung around and my friends were all Giants fans and we'd sit there and watch Giants games all the time. But, you know, certain teams would come into Oakland and we'd go watch A's games. When I went to Cal my freshman year, we'd all that night, we'd go drink beers in the bleachers at A's games. And then, to play for both organizations and to play in 1999 for the Giants, the last year at Candlestick Park, you know, growing up a Giants fan, 
watching all the players because they had so many tributes during that season to the teams of the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and to become friends with Willie Mays and to to this day become friends with Will Clark, who I grew up rooting for. Some of the stuff when I'm even just saying it to you is so surreal at this point. Um, so that was cool. And I'm still working with the Giants organization. But 2001 with the A's was probably my – the most fun I've ever had playing baseball. We were 102 and 60. We won every damn night and we didn't just win. We won 10 to two every night. Like we had Zito Mulder and Hudson. We had Jason Giambi, Tejada, Chavez, Frankie Menachino and I platooned at second base. We had Johnny Damon in center, Jermaine Dye and left and Terrence Long and right. Ramon Hernandez was our catcher and we won 102 games. And I think to this day, Billy Beans still says that's the best team he ever had, 2001. It didn't work out, the Jeter flip game. Yeah. You know, you got to be lucky in the playoffs. But, like, I've never been around a group that was more together, more close. Like, when we went out at night, we went out 16, 17 deep. We would take over bars. And we did party hard. But we also played hard and we kept each other accountable. We policed ourselves. So if somebody was getting a little out of control, we'd rail them back in and say, like, look, dude, this, this, and this. Ron Gant was a veteran player on that team. And he and I, with Jason Giambi, kind of reeled in the 22, 23-year-olds when we had to so that, you know, we didn't get too silly. <clears throat> but it was a beautiful thing, man, where we loved each other. We couldn't wait to get to the ballpark with each other. We didn't just beat your team on the road, JP. We beat your city. So when the plane took off on Sunday after the game, we just swept your team. We could see smoke coming from the city <laughs> because we, we went out. We drank your beers. We, we met your people, however you want to put that. And then, and then we beat your team in front of your fans. And we would beat your will to win. We knew when we showed up Sunday. We'd stay out late Saturday night because we knew Sunday – that team didn't want to even play us anymore because we beat their will to win. And I used to sit down in DC when I was a broadcaster there with Jason Worth. And I would say, Jason, you guys got to have this mentality where it's not just winning a game. It's, it's beating. We used to beat the team and we used to beat the city and we used to beat their will to win. And that, that was a special thing that, I mean, I don't know how Billy did it. Jason used to call us the Island of Misfit Toys <laughs> release player here, release player there. Jason was the MVP. We had some stud arms, which is how you win. But we just believed in ourselves. And we, I mean, JP, we'd be in the middle of the game and guys would say, hey, we got to start making some outs. Like, we we got to be at the club at like 1030. This is taking too long. And, and Art would just, God bless Art. <laughs> Art, just, Art just let us be. He didn't overmanage, overdiscipline. He knew he had a good thing and he would hear that stuff and just kind of giggle like, <laughs> and he didn't. And I don't know, man, they, I could talk. I could talk for an hour about the 2001 Oakland A's. It's the most fun I ever had in ba baseball. It was like Motley Crue meets baseball. We were like a rock and roll band that won every night. <clears throat> that was my, that was my last year in Oakland and having helped put those teams together with Billy. I, I would have to agree with you. I think that that was a combination of, um, so many good things coming together. That was a powerhouse team. And I don't know if Giambi slides, maybe it's a whole different, uh, it's a whole different series, but I still have bad flashbacks when I see the highlight. Um, so, you know, obviously you, you go on to, to a, a nice career as a broadcaster, but I want to step back and, and touch because you're so close to the Bay area right now. Tell us the pulse of what's happening in Oakland. It's, it's a sad story. And, uh, you know, from someone who grew up in the in the Bay Area, someone who played for the team, you know, what's the your sentiments and what's the pulse of the city with the A's leaving? Man, it's sad, JP, and I'm sure you feel the same way. I sent you that video the other yeah, day. Yeah, it's not a nice video. Stuff floating around about, I mean, you talk about the history of that organization and all the World Series and all the great players and that have played, and it, it, as Jason used to put, wore the clown shoes, the, the white cleats, and, and played for the, the Oakland A's and – and, and the fan base, as you know, was passionate, man, hardcore. 15,000 would sound like 30 or 40,000. And they showed up every single night. And just to see what it's become and, and to see how run down and how they just quit. If you, I just feel like they quit. Like you go to the ballpark now and there's like seats taped together. And they. I, I went two years ago with my son and they ran out of food in like the second inning. Yeah. And, 
I mean, it's just, I feel bad for the fans. And all of us, like Frankie and I have been texting, Burns and I have been texting, like we're sending each other all this stuff. And, and it's just, it's just really sad that, that it's such a story franchise with such tremendous history has come to this, that, 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 yeah, I don't know how it all went down. Politics, ownership. I, I, I don't. I don't ever get involved in the middle of all that stuff. But I do know that that place has always had a special place in my heart and the organization too. And I, I you know, I did pregame and postgame for the A's for a couple of years. So, you know, I've I've been involved in that organization a lot throughout my career. And I'm sure you can. You feel the same way. Just the, the way this whole thing goes has gone down. I'm from Sacramento. So, like, in one regard, it's cool that friends and family get to see teams next year, but, like, they're playing in a minor league stadium. I don't – you work your whole life to see the third and fourth decks to right. play in cathedrals, and now they're playing in a minor league stadium. It's just it, – it's awful. It's bad for baseball, but it's really bad for A's fans in the Bay Area. And I would even go as far as to say it's bad for Giants fans, too, because the rivalry and, like, A's and Giants fans are always talking smack to each other about how many rings do you have, how many World Series – you know, this organization, that organization, it, it would be like, it would be like the Yankees without the Mets. Right. And that's kind of what's going on right now. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because obviously I worked 16 years in Oakland and the last five before I retired, I was in San Francisco and I never realized, <clears throat> I knew the A's fans were just passionate. There might be 10,000 of them, but they're the most passionate group you're ever going to be in front of. But I never realized how big the Giants were in the Bay Area until I worked with the Giants. And they, they, they are kind of like the Yankees to the Mets. Um, so I, I would agree with you. I think the A's leaving is going to hurt the Giants. I know they're going to have the whole area to themselves, but I think there's something to be said for, for cities that can have two teams and, and, and feed off each other. Yeah, it's good for the fan base. It's good for, it's good for the teams and the rivalry. Um, I saw something the other day where the Giants are just going to be like the Yankees in about five or six years because now they have zero competition. They're just going to take over this market, and it's going to get really big. So we'll see how that whole thing pans out. We don't have enough time to get into what's going on <laughs> on this side of the bay right now, but uh, the Giants are having a rough year. They had a good win last night, but they're having a tough year. Yeah. Um, so you watch the game from a whole different perspective now. Obviously, I used to run into you in Washington all the time. I thought you did a great job there. What – share with me, what do you think about the game today? What, what do you like about the game? What don't you like about the game? Well, I'm not one of those old guys that thinks the game is horrible right now. I have a lot of teammates that are so grouchy, and they just think the game is awful. There's so much talent in the game right now, whether it's Ronald Acuna Jr., who we haven't seen a whole lot of this year because he got hurt, or Juan Soto, and all the young talent. This Churio guy I've been watching from the Brewers is amazing. My goodness, he's one of the best players I've seen in a long time. Um so the game's okay. I mean, there's great pitchers, great young pitchers. The game's the game's cruising along. It's doing okay. I think we're tinkering with it way too much. I think it's a hard game for the average fan to follow, and if we keep changing the rules every year, it's making it even harder for the average fan to understand what's going on in baseball. Um, I, I, I don't like the fact that it's, it, it, it's getting back to emphasis on athleticism and speed and base running, which we got so far away from that with the shift and with home runs and hitting the ball over the shift, because as you know, players are going to chase the money. And if you're getting paid for hitting homers and OPS and slugging, you're going to chase that. But now the stolen base is back and, and, and athleticism on defense is back without the shift. So I, I do think the game's heading in a good direction. I just, I keep hearing these rules where we're like pit starting pitchers are going to have to go th so many innings and, like, just, just knock it off. Like, you made some good changes. The pitch clock I was fundamentally against, I like it now because I get home sooner. Um, I, so, there's the, baseball's – baseball's – we just got to be careful, man. It's, it's the best sport there is. It's the best game there is. And if we keep screwing with it and we keep having people in suits that never played the game screwing with it, we're going to be in trouble, man. I mean, right now the game is really sterile. You can't break up a double play. You can't run over a catcher. We have a million rules that I even have trouble keeping up with. <laughs> and, and it's just, I, I want to get back to getting guys over, getting guys in, button guys over, hitting and running, playing defense, pitching, and not just throw it as hard as you can and swing it as hard as you can. I, I get super excited when a guy like Luis Arise doesn't strike out for 141 plate appearances. Because me, like striking out's a mindset. If you want to, if you want to fight and you want to battle, you can do that. But like, 
guys don't anymore. They take three O hacks and O two counts, and it's it just go. It, back in the day, JP was the biggest way you could get beat was to get to strike out and have to like drag your bat back to the bench. Now, these guys don't even care anymore. So I'm, I'm I'm excited. There's an emphasis on base running athleticism. Now I think if, if I were in baseball and I've thought about getting into coaching here in the next few years that I would really emphasize base running for an organization and really emphasize putting the ball in play. You, you see guys bunt now. They don't know how, but if they finally do get a bunt down, it's like the defense goes crazy. They lose their minds. They throw it down the right field line. They don't practice bunt Ds. Like there's so many ways that are out there right now so to win baseball games at the highest level. And the teams that are doing the little things, right. like M- Milwaukee's my favorite team in baseball right now. They play the game the, the right way. They're pesky at the plate. They don't strike out. They have team speed. They steal bases, intelligently steal bases. They don't just run the run like Ellie De La Cruz. They, they run when it's everybody knows they're running. They still steal the base. They have great starting pitching. They have great relievers that throw 100 miles an hour. And they play outstanding defense at every position. So they're, they're a bunch of like, without Christian Yelich, you don't really know who these guys are. I just did a series against the Brewers. I'm like, that, that's the best team I've seen this year. I love the Phillies, too, because they play the game the right way with Rob Thompson, who's one of the best managers in baseball. But the, 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 you talk about the Orioles, the Royals. There's teams that are starting to, to emphasize young players that play the game the right way. And those are the teams that all of a sudden, whoops, we stand out. Because if, if, you're, in, if you're stuck in 2022 – where we're slugging and we're trying to hit homers. Yeah, homers are great, but if you build your team without team speed and a bunch of stiffs that swing as hard as they can, you're not going to win. It's back to athleticism, and it's back to the baseball that you and I grew up with. You're not going to win in the playoffs because you can shut that down real fast. Yeah. So I want you to touch on uh, – we're getting close to the end here, but I want you to touch on I, – I, I made a statement the other day, and I, I thought long and hard about it before I made the statement. I believe Otani's the greatest baseball player who ever lived. I know it's a strong statement. When you think of Bonds, when you think of Mays, and you think of Aaron and Ruth. And But to be able to do what he's doing in this day and age with the pitching he has to face as far as velo and things like that, what are your thoughts on Otani? So, I mean, I, it's hard to argue with that, JP, especially if he's pitching. I mean, when he, he comes back and he's pitching too, and there's a big debate, should he pitch or not? Like the numbers he's put up and what he's done under the big spotlight and the big in a big market with a big contract is amazing to me. The one thing I always go back to, and it's no fault of his own because of his, his Tommy John surgery, is how much mental and physical effort it takes to play a position for 162 games. Right. So even I remember years where in – September running out to center field was hard and running in from center field was hard just running in and running out to my position because I was so banged up so I guess I am taking a little bit away from it like Barry Bonds stood in left field and he played he wasn't a DH like he played a position Francisco Lindor who's had a tremendous season with the Mets is playing a premium position so when I think of what Otani's done this year, he's got 48 home runs, 48 stolen bases. He's hitting three-something. Unbelievable. And he might be the best player that ever played when it's all said and done. Man, I just think there's two sides to the game, lumber and leather, man. And it, for me, if I was 0 for 4, I could help you win a game on defense. So, I, I mean, yeah, he's probably the greatest player ever. I can't disagree with that. I just think it takes a little bit away that, that he doesn't play a position and how much, based on experience, the physicality of it and having to concentrate on every pitch all season long that it's coming to me wherever I'm standing, man, that that's a grind that takes it out of you after six months. Well, like you said, no fault of his own. I mean, you got the Tommy yeah. John. If, if he doesn't have Tommy John, he's, he's pitching on top of hitting. So pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah. He's, he's amazing. Um, real quick. Who do you like in the national league? Who do you like in the American league? I really like the Brewers, like I just said. Uh, I root for the Phillies because of Bryce Harper and Trey Turner. Um, and I had a wonderful experience the year I went to spring training with the Yankees with Rob Thompson. He's a wonderful dude. So, you know, I like Schwarber. Uh, I like Castellanos. I just like – I like their cockiness and I like their swagger. And it reminds me of the 2001 A's. They all got long hair. They all got beards. They all got an edge to them. They all got, a, they all got that, that cockiness that you want in your team. And they seem like a real together bunch. 
the other day when Castellanos got hit and Harper charged the mound from second base. Like that's the stuff that gets me off now at my age. They, they seem like they're they're a real team. Um, so I, I like I like those two. I, I'm not. Yeah, I, I think that would be a great NLCS with those two teams. Can't count out the Dodgers. Uh, and in the American League, I'm a little more challenged because I'm a National League guy. Um, I'm a big Juan Soto fan because I got to know him real well in D.C. So I, I do pull for the Yankees and I like Booney a lot. And I think Judge is everything that's good about baseball. So I think a, a Yankees Phillies World Series would be awesome. I, I think the networks would love it. I think the nation would love it. You know, I was telling someone the other day, until you go to Philadelphia and see a game, these Phillies are like the old Broad Street bullies, the hockey team. That town has taken to that team and that team to that town. It's like going to a college baseball, a football game. The place is raucous from the first pitch. It's a definite home field advantage. It is. And, and I yeah, I remember when I was in D.C. going to the bank in Philly and, and there was nobody there. Right. They had some lean years. And now they got, you know, they got that team and that town. I mean, that team's built for that town or vice versa. I don't know. Yeah, I Just agree. The guys like Bryce. Bryce is all grown up now. Like I knew Bryce in D.C. when he was 19, 20 and 21. Now he's got kids. Apparently he's the leader on that team. Yeah. He's keeping guys accountable. Um, he's all grown up. He's like the captain now. And that's good to see. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'll tell you what, JP, the team I've watched the most this year besides the Giants is the Phillies. Whenever I'm sitting here in the West Coast and the East Coast games are on in the package, I always turn on the Philly game because I, I love to watch those guys play. Yeah, they compete. They, they get after it. And if you're not ready when you walk in there, you're going to get you're going to get something handed to you. Yeah. Uh, so tell us just wrapping up here. You're enjoying what you're doing. Tell us what you're doing. Share with us real quick and, and what you like about it. I'm blessed, man. I'm, I'm here in San Francisco. My kid lives in Walnut Creek. He's getting married on Friday. So that's a big deal. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. Uh, it, my parents live in Sacramento, which is an hour and a half away. I spent all those years on the East Coast missing everything. So I'm back home. Uh, I'm doing about 50 games on the radio with the Giants. I'm in charge of their fantasy baseball camps, which is really cool because you meet a lot of really nice people that are very successful in different walks of life. And it's selfishly, it's a good networking thing. And I, you know, the, the giants have a saying forever giant. Yeah. And, and it's a thing. Like I, I played one year here. I coached two years in a ball here. I broadcast for about, I'd say seven, eight years here. And they just took me right back in. Like I'm part of the family. As you know, you lived it. It's a first class organization. I always say it's the Yankees of the West coast and, um, I'm super, super fortunate and blessed that they've taken me back in the fold, the broadcasters and from upper management all the way to Bob Melvin. Uh, it, it's just, it's a great, it's a great organization to be associated with. Well, I want to thank you so much for doing this, taking your time. Always been a class act, always been one of my favorites, wish you nothing but the best. And hopefully we can catch up as we keep going with this show. All right, JP. Thanks. I still got my FP hat. So thanks for that too. <laughs> All right, buddy. Take care. See you. See you. Bye. Well, JP, you were right. He's a character in the game. So uh, thanks for bringing him on. Good one. Yeah, FP's a piece of work. Uh, great <laughs> passion for the game, though. I, I love the guys that have the passion, not only as players, whatever their background is, but they continue to have it through the through their life as they get older and they move into different areas. Uh, and he's got a strong passion for the game of baseball. And it's always nice to have just keep getting different viewpoints on the show. Yeah, and uh, next week, I know you've already lined up a huge guest for a special program-long batter up with JP. Yeah, really excited to get our next guest on. It's going to be Brian Sabian, the, the former general manager of the San Francisco Giants, who in my estimation is a Hall of Famer. Uh, he's built teams. He's had World Series teams, three. Uh, I think he won three in six years. He went to four. Uh, also cut his teeth with the Yankees. So a baseball lifer who's back with the Yankees now, but more importantly can touch on his great success in San Francisco and a good friend of mine for a long time. Excellent. We're going to look forward to that very much. Uh, don't forget, everybody, follow uh, JP on social media. That's the place to go to see some great content, opinions, clips from this program, clips from JP's announcing, his analysis, uh, some really great retro photos of JP as well. So follow him now on either X or Instagram at R-I-C-C-I-A-R-D-I-J-P. 
And don't forget to subscribe to this show on your favorite podcast platform, whether it's Spotify or Apple or Odyssey or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And check out the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash brushback. Until next week, when we return, this is John Arezzi for JP. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs>